Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com, or perhaps for this video I should say I'm John from Iron Bottom Sound, but we'll get into that a little bit later. And I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 172nd scale USS Scamp SSN 588 Fast Attack Submarine. Obviously this model here is definitely outside of my normal working routine, which is either small or large scale military vehicles and tanks. This being a submarine, it's definitely not one of those things. However, as I touched upon a year ago, I recently built a 172nd scale USS Skipjack kit from the company Mobius. Well, in that video, I stated that I enjoyed that model so much, I wouldn't mind going ahead and building the other subs in the Skipjack class range. In fact, I believe I did say that, which sounds something like this. After building this one here, I could definitely see myself acquiring more from my own personal collection. I might be expanding my navy quite a bit as time goes on. Well, as you can see, I am most definitely a man of my word. This model here started off with the exact same type of starter kit, being the 172nd scale USS Skipjack kit from Mobius. However, unlike the last video where it was just a one and done type build, this one here, I'm actually going to cut it up into a two part video series. This is because unlike the last video, this one here, I'm going to take you from start all the way to finish. So part one is going to have the model during the course construction, and I'm gonna walk you along with all the modifications and add-ons that I made to this particular example while part two is going to be your garden variety ECA model showcase video. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the content that's gonna be coming right at you. However, to kick this video off, let's go ahead and rewind to when this model was first started. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 172nd scale USS Skipjack fast attack nuclear submarine kit from Mobius. Normally at this point in the video, I'd be wearing my signature black gloves and I'd be giving this model a thorough inbox review, as well as going over the kit history of this particular model. Well, I'm not going to be doing that in this video because, well, I've already did that to great lengths and depths in the previous USS Skipjack video build that I posted a little while ago. If you're interested in catching up on that info, I recommend checking it out via the link that's listed in the video description below. However, I will state that at the time of filming this video, these kits are fairly prolific and are somewhat easy to come by. I picked up this one from Amazon.com and just like the last USS Skipjack, I got it for free because, well, I had a number of credit card points saved up from over the years. So, just like with the last one, I splurged them on this one here and let's go ahead and see if I could build this one up to the same standard. One weird quirk that I wanted to point out about this particular build, and I don't believe this is something that I noticed on the other Skipjack build, involves this side panel that we have here. Whoever laid this out in whatever graphic design program they were using screwed up with the layer orientation. You can see that here we have the the artwork that's found on the main box art, and it's directly over the typeface that we have right here. If I go to the opposite side, you can see that the format's a little bit different, but again, whoever laid this out in probably Adobe InDesign or maybe Quark Express, and wow, I'm not even sure if that's even so relevant anymore. It shows you how long it's been since I worked in the field. Uh, yeah, they, they definitely screwed this up, and I'm surprised this got through all of the checks that, that you know these things go through prior to going into print and production. So it's just an interesting quirk that I did want to point out at this time. So here I have the whole section strewn out on the table, but I want to bring attention to this little runner that we have here prior to me going ahead and starting with the actual assembly of these hull parts. And that's because in order for me to fit these components on, it needs to be done at this point. What they are exactly? Well, let's bring the camera in closer, shall we? Before I go ahead and point out the runner, I just want to briefly show some of the molded detailing found on the model itself. This is the bow section. Here we have the front hatch that's of course located on, well, the bow. The hatch does have the appearance of the appropriate shape of the Skipjack class hatch. However, it's rather simplistic in its overall detailing. This is something that of course is not unheard of in the realm of plastic models and if anyone has watched this channel, you'll know that I, you know, talk about that quite a bit. However, on the last Skipjack build that I worked on, I went ahead and left it totally stock without really lifting a finger on changing some of the molding and details. And I basically just worked around them. Well, for this one here, I wanted to do things a little bit differently, so I wanted to approve upon what I saw on the last build. And that includes the changing of the hatch that we have molded on. To get an idea on 
how simplistic the molded in hatch is here. Here I have the replacement hatch that's found on this runner. As you can see, the geometry is basically the same. However, what changed is the depth found on the middle portion here of the hatch. If you notice, the piece descends downward, and then there's this large hook that protrudes from the center. To get this detailing here, I <laughs> went through many photographs of several variants of the USS Skipjack class, and I basically was able to compile the detailing you see here from all those photographs. With the way the piece is designed, it's meant to be a drop-in replacement for the molded detailing. However, to do so, you will need to amputate the molded-in hatch. Now, with the way the piece is designed, it is, of course, molded into the model here with this nice little seam line. And this seam line, well, acts as your boundary point on the material that needs to be removed. The new addition will just drop directly in from underneath, which is why it has this large little plate that we have here. Because of this design, all you gotta do is just add some drops of glue around the edge here of the hatch, and then just stick it through the new hole that will be present once this material is removed. So that explains exactly how the hatches work, but now you're wondering, well, John, what are these other three components that are found here on this runner? Well, these components are going to be utilized on the sail portion, which will be discussed in more depth as this video goes on. As for the parts themselves, they are made in HD 3D printed material, and these parts here have been added to the newly resurrected Iron Bottom Sound website. For those who don't know, Iron Bottom Sound was actually a side company that I created with my father a number of years ago. And after a few years of operation, my dad wanted to, you know, do other things. So the website was basically just shut down. Well, with these parts over here, I decided to resurrect the website and that's where you find these components. Many of the older items that were on the website originally have been phased out due to the molds being worn out. However, I am in the process of slowly rebuilding the website up and offering many of the older sets, but retooled with modern 3D printed components. These sets over here, along with many others that I have in the pipeline for the Skipjack, are among some of the first. So if, in order to find the IBS website, that can be found via the link listed below. In order to secure on that new bit of detailing I designed, like I stated before, the kit section here needs to be removed. To do this, I'm going to be utilizing a Dremel with a high speed removal bit. The bit is the smaller variant, which is going to be a little bit handier with getting into these tighter confines, and it gives me a little bit more precision. Where things are going to get a little interesting is with the end portion, where you notice the piece is squared off. This is going to be done with a wide needle file, and I'm going to be going ahead and taking care of that by hand. But before I do that, I need to first remove the bulk of the round section that we have right here. The same technique is also going to be done on the one on the aft, so there's no point really showing that on screen. Let me just go ahead and take care of this guy that we have here. Well, with the dremeling out of the way, you can see that it did a fantastic job with removing just the right amount of material that needs to be removed. One thing I do have to stress that when you're doing this procedure, you want to have a nice steady hand, and you also want to position the hull section on a nice steady work surface. This gives you some added stability and it'll prevent any sort of snafus like over drilling. If you do over drill, you are going to have to replenish that cutaway area with a little bit of body work. It's not the end of the world, but it is going to add a little bit more complexity to the procedure. So with the Dremel, or I should say the round section out of the way, the next is to tackle the squared off sections on the top. And this I'm going to be switching over to a needle file and it's going to be done the old fashioned way with, well, good old elbow grease.
So there you can see what the hatch looks like now fully removed. And just in comparison, you can see here what it looks like originally with the molding and tooling. So with this removed, I can now go ahead and get the 3D printed hatch to mount in place. However, I quickly see there's one thing that I need to approve upon the 3D printed set. And that has to do with the thickness. When I was designing this piece, I didn't have a hull in front of me specifically with the section drilled out. So I was basically just going by what I remember from the previous model, and that's the thickness here of the plastic. Well, apparently on the top portion here, Mobius, wisely I might add, went ahead and added a little bit more material, making it for a thicker section. Because of the way I have the set, it's not going to be a perfect flush fit, so I am going to have to do a little bit of tweaking to the 3D printed test sample that I have here. For the actual production units, the one that will be posted on the ECA catalog, or in this case the IBS catalog, uh, the pieces will have the correct thicknesses, so when it comes time for installation, no other work needs to be done. You just snip it off and you just glue it directly from the underneath, like I touched upon before. With the stern and the bow hatches carved out, I can now go ahead and progress with the next leg, which is to get the hull into assembly. The hull on this model, of course, is in four components. We have two rear sections and two front portions, and they all puzzle fit together to form the shape of the cigar-shaped hull. On this model over here, the way I like to assemble them is I like to assemble the stern and the bow sections on both the upper and lower sections first, prior to then mating everything together, and there's a reason for that, and I'll touch upon that in a moment. Before I do, however, I want to prep the sections. With the way the pieces are molded, you have these nubs, or I should say molding tabs, found on a few sections on the lip here of the upper and lower hull. These are best polished away at this point here, as trying to remove these once everything is fully assembled becomes a little bit tricky and actually requires a little bit more work. So polishing them now at this point saves you some time and also a little bit of effort. Another thing that I want to mention is that with the way the pieces are molded, there is a slight flash seam running along the leading edge here of all four of the hull components. On this particular example, there is just a small little tang of flash. This is really nothing. Some uh, snobby modeling elitists out there like to turn their noses up at something like this, but those guys are insufferable a-holes, so don't worry about that. Uh, this flash is not a problem. This can easily be cut away with an exacto or even with a file. Either should do the job. But again, it, I like to remove all of these type of things prior to the model progressing further with its assembly because again, this is a way to smooth out production and to avoid any sort of potential issues. For the big nubs, I'm going to utilize my file. And I'm just going to simply just polish these sections away in that format. For the leading edge flashing that I was talking about before, this is going to be taken care of with, well, just a sharp X-Acto knife. So now that all the parts have been deburred and also deflashed, the next thing to do is to start assembling the halves together. And this is something that I touched upon in the last Skipjack video, but it looks like it's a common thing to find on all of these Mobius Skipjack kits. And that has to do with the circumferences on the rear and the front sections. If we look at the portions, if I hit on screen anyhow, you'll see that the inner one here, or I should say the rear section, the curvature is smushed slightly, which changes the diameter of the outer portion. Why this is relevant is that when it comes time to plug the two units together, you're gonna see that the rear seems to be smaller in size. Obviously, this is not the case. This is just 
due to the way the model is probably packaged, everything gets squished together in the box and it takes that shape. When it comes time for gluing the pieces together, you do have to stretch them out a little bit. And once you jig everything in place, this will keep it at its appropriate shape. I also want to point out that on this one here, it doesn't seem to be that bad. On the last skipjack that I did, the the deformation was a little bit more, but deformation is really not the right word to use. So I don't really know what to call it, but again, it's just something to keep in mind. Another thing I want to point out is that the hull sections do not plug together in a positive way. And what I mean by that is that there are no snaps or any sort of other retention systems that are built into the kit. So you have this like tongue and groove type system and on the top here, it what looks like some kind of a locking tab, but on the opposite side here, you can see that there's really nothing there to positively engage in, click the piece in place. When I line the pieces up, you'll see that they just basically just hang there and it's just dependent solely on the adhesives to keep everything in place and to prevent any sort of components from popping off. On the one on the top, at least you do have that extra little alignment tab. With the sections on the bottom, the bottom, that's not the case at all. Okay, there's just a tongue and groove, not just a tongue and tongue system, and that's basically all you have. So jigging is going to be the most important bit of procedure that needs to be done at this point here. If something is not properly lined up, this will have a domino type effect that will lead to a bunch of problems as the model progresses from this point onward. For getting the pieces to assemble, obviously you're going to need some kind of adhesive. For me, I'm going to go to my go-to, which is Pro Fix EA from Great Plains. This is the same stuff that I've touched upon in many other videos, and I've used it for just about all of my modeling applications. From my plastic models to my not-so-plastic models, this stuff here is always used in one way, shape, or form or another. Other people out there, for their plastic models, they tend to use a cement type solvent. I'm, I was never really a fan of those materials. I've tried with them in the past and I was never really satisfied or impressed for that matter with the results. Whatever you use though, don't use Tester's Red Tube Model Glue. As we know that stuff is junk and it's just, just don't do it. Ever. Ever. Just don't do it. So, Aside from the glue, you're also going to need a way to jig it in place. And if anyone has seen the last Skipjack video, you'll probably be seeing the same information again, which is going to be the use of some clamps. And also, may seem a bit overkill, but one of these type of Y-capacity vice grips. The vice grip seems, again, to be a bit on the over engineered end, but keep in mind you need to get a way to pinch this area over here in the dead center of the hull, and something like this is not going to be able to reach in there. The vice grip, however, can do that with ease. So, to start with the assembly, I'm going to take the glue and I'm going to apply it in this section over here, and I'm going to use a fairly liberal amount on that. The reason why I'm applying it to this section and not on this section is again, like I may have stated in the other video, if you apply the glue in this type of system and you insert it, all that glue is going to puddle up towards the leading edge and then once the piece is fully set in, you can have a bit of oozing going on in this section. It's not impossible to remedy, obviously, you could just polish it down with some sandpaper, but it's a little bit more extra body work that you now need to undertake. Also, it tends to get, you know, all over the place, things can stick to it, you could get fingerprints on it, eh, it just leads to some other problems that it's really best to avoid. So I'm going to go ahead and actually start it right now. And if anyone's from Australia watching this right now, yeah, this is the submarine technology that we're going to be giving you soon, so keep that in mind. So now that there's glue on the section, I'm going to first line up this area here of the hull. Like I said before, it's super important and crucial that these areas line up appropriately. So with the clamps, I'm going to go ahead and jig it in place. And by the way, it's a lot easier to do when you're not on camera, but I should be able to muscle my way through regardless. Okay, so once this corner here is pinched. I could then go ahead and line up the other corner on the opposite side. 
And after a little bit of wrangling, I was able to get the clamps in their appropriate locations. And I have one more of these guys left to go, which I'm going to apply right over here. When it comes for the vice grip, obviously you don't want to have it too tight where you can cause harm to the plastic. Just enough so the piece will just click in place before you feel any sort of tension from the plastic. This right now it's set a little bit too tight, I feel. So I'm just go ahead and loosen it just a little bit. Let's try that again. Perfect. Okay, so this thing now is going to be set aside where I will let it do probably one of the most important techniques in model making, which is letting it dry. So as soon as the glue is set, I'll be able to pop the restraints off, do the same procedure to the one on the top portion, and then I can progress from there. With the pieces now as one section, you can see the seam line here that runs across where the two sections meet. And this is not, of course, exclusive to the top because the bottom has it also. Although on the bottom, and this was something that I did encounter on the other skipjack, was that the side sections here do not match up perfectly, so there is a small little indent. This is something that needs to be addressed at this point of the build via some bodywork with a little bit of sanding. One advantage that the skipjack kit does have is that because there are no molded on weld lines or any other sort of surface detailing on these sections, deleting the seams in these areas here is relatively easily done. It's also at this time of the build where I'm going to go ahead and address these two seams here. Now, technically, yes, you can actually assemble the hull halves together and then do all of the bodywork in one shot. However, I found it easier to do it in this approach where you do the two seams along these areas here just to make sure that they've been taken care of. Once these two are out of the way, then I could go ahead and go through the process of mounting the upper and lower hulls together, and then I could go for the second and tertiary coats of bodywork, which is going to be deleting the main seam that connects the two halves together, but I'm also going to knock out the waterline suggestion seam that's present on the moldings. I'm going to be going into more detail on that as the video goes on, but from here, I'm actually going to go ahead and start with the bodywork process. For the one here on the top, it's not too much. What I'm going to do is I'm first going to polish down the area with a little bit of hand sanding. And once that's done, I could apply a small little thin smear of red putty. Once the red putty sets, I could then go ahead and continue with the polishing with just some basic hand sanding. For this one over here, I'm going to hit it with a palm sander just so I could knock out as much of this inset as possible. And then once that is prepped, I could then progress with the smear of red putty and then pick up where the other one left off with just some hand sanding with some sandpaper. Not gonna lie, it might be tricky to get on camera, but you know, we'll see how things pan out.
So here are the hulls sitting outdoors going through their sanding process. The one here on the left has already gone through its dry and wet sanding phase. And this one here I'm about to dig into it with the dry sandpaper. Obviously because of all of the putty that's going to be sanded off, this type of technique is a bit messy and it's best done outdoors when applicable. For the sandpapers that I use, I first start off with the 150 grit sandpaper. This is typically done dry, but you can also use this for wet sanding if necessary. And for the finer stuff, I go with the 400 grit like you see here. Typically, this is the stuff that I use with the wet sanding to get the look that we see right here on this example. And in case anyone's wondering exactly how much powder does this create, well, as you can see, quite a bit. Yeah, this is why I recommend doing this technique outdoors. With the hull halves going through their assembly and bodywork, the next leg of the build is to tackle all of the components that we see here. These are mostly going to consist of the bow planes, the rudders, as well as a few other sections of the array that need to be assembled at this point here because once it comes time for the hull assemblies to be mated together, these pieces need to be completed as well as prepped prior to the assembly of the hull sections. What I mean by that is that the fins are all a two-piece assembly, so there are some seams that do need to be contended with, and obviously it's best done prior to the hull heads being installed. So with that all the way, let's go ahead and open this baggie up. So here are the parts out of the bags, nothing much to write home about, they're again a two piece assembly like I stated earlier. So let's go ahead, cut across to where these are all assembled and where I'm tackling all of the seam work. And here are all the parts now with their two half assemblies installed. The amount of body work on some of the seams can vary from very minuscule to a little bit more in depth. And what I mean by that is like, for instance, on some of these units over here, with the way the two pieces are installed, the seam line is basically minimum. And so just a few up and down polishing with some fine sandpaper should do the trick to get rid of it. And same can also be true for a few of the other fins like this one here, where the seam would be on the front, the rear, as well as also a little bit on the top. The ones that probably need a little bit more extra polishing are the two dive planes that we have right here and here. The two stern planes have this small little ridge that we have right over here and this is designed so when the pieces assemble they go on in a certain way. It's a decent design. And the seam line is very very minimum and it's also on the bottom portion of the fin so you know that's another thing to consider. For this you can polish it either with some super glue and and wipe it down or you can do what I'm going to do and just put a nice little quick smear of red putty on this location which should also do a good job with getting everything polished away. On the top rudder that we have right here which is distinguishable by, by the way with this little beacon that's integrally molded on we have this little line that is molded in. This line here is actually the water line or it's supposed to indicate where the water line goes. Like I said in the other video this kit does have a molded in waterline suggestion point and this is something that is I'm not really a fan of and in my opinion it's detracts slightly from the look of the model so on this build here I'm going to get rid of that altogether. For this this is going to be polished away with some red putty I'm just going to smear it in this location over here and then just like with the other thing just polish it down to the point where the seam is no longer present. With the planes and rudders all wrapped up, it's now time to focus on the upper and lower hulls, getting them ready for final assembly. On the stern section over here, with the way the molds are designed, you are going to have the small little ridge that is present right here, right behind the dive plane. This little material gets in the way and also it can't hurt the look of the model, but it's, luckily it's something that's easily remedied with a few swipes of sandpaper. This is done to both the left and right hand side, as well as also the same corresponding locations on the upper hull segment. 
The next thing I want to touch upon is going to require a little bit more body work, and that involves these two ovular holes that are found on the bow and the stern. What these are, are securing locations for the kit supplied stand. The hull plugs into these sections here, and this allows you to prop the model up on your desk or, you know, wherever you deem fit. For me, however, I always was never a fan of this type of a stand solution on models. In my opinion, it hurts the look of the build, and it detracts from the otherwise seamless nature of the lower hull. Plus, since I'm going to be using my own stand for this model, these sections here are just not necessary. So, they need to be plugged up. Fortunately, there are a multitude of different ways to go about this. You can insert some scrap plastic, you can fill it in with an epoxy, bondo, you know, there's a bunch of different techniques that will lead you to the same end result. For me, I'm actually going to use some of the kit stand itself. The sections that actually plug into the model, I'm going to cut away on the bandsaw, glue them in place, and this is going to remove a good chunk of the hole that's found on the bottom portion here that needs to be filled in. Now there is a small little hole right here in the center, which I'm still going to need to plug it up, but it's easier to plug up a hole like this as opposed to something as large as this one here. So I'm just going to go ahead, amputate these sections, and then I could progress further with the bodywork. To fill in the other two holes, I'm just going to use some sections from the scrap runner from another plastic model that I recently completed, and this one was just lifted out of the garbage can. So I'm just going to snip away some plastic pieces, and these two now will be able to be used to plug up those two holes. Alright, now I just let it dry, then once the glue is fully set, I can go ahead and polish both of these areas down to leave for a nice smooth surface. With the nubs sanded and flushed away, the next thing to do is to, well, secure the upper and lower hull halves together. One thing I do want to point out, though, is that the bodywork still needs to be done on the nub over here. This was just a preliminary sanding, just to get rid of all that extra bulk that was remaining from when the pieces were installed. This is best done when everything is, is assembled, because you're going to be doing a lot of bodywork on the hull seams here, so it's just one other thing to take care of when you're going through all of that procedure. Now that the hatches are installed, the upper and lower hulls are ready for their final assembly. So before I do that though, there are two things that you need to install before you can go ahead and start with the gluing. The first are the stern planes. They need to be positioned in place because once the units get sandwiched together, these pieces here can no longer be mounted. On a similar note, the other thing is the, the shaft for the propeller. The prop shaft is a small little lug that gets fit into this little recess over here and it's held in place with the geometry of these molded in sections. Just like with the stern planes, this too needs to be added at this point before everything gets mounted in place because again, once it gets secured, you're not going to be able to install it. For the stern planes, another tip is to 
install them with the bodywork section pointing downward. This is so it's less visible. Now, even though the bodywork was done and it is going to be a seamless piece, it's still best to have the piece that has absolutely no seam work on it whatsoever to be towards the majority of the viewers. I need to say this because the stern planes are reversible, so this is something just to keep in mind. It's just a, you know, a simple tip when working on one of these submarines. The stern planes just get dropped directly into place, as you see. And the propeller shaft nub will follow suit. The little nub goes into this little recess that we have right over here and just drops right in. The propeller is supposed to spin on this model, so you don't want to have any sort of glues on this little vicinity. Although some might argue that's a useless feature that this model does have, but you know, it is a feature that I personally appreciate. And that's it. Now it's time to start applying the glue. Just like with the propeller shaft, you want to be very careful with the glue application around the areas here where the stern planes are present because again, they're supposed to be able to function and it, by gluing them in place, you're kind of kneecapping yourself. So care must be exhibited by the builder in that regard. When it comes for adding the glue, I like to add it on the lower section because this section here holds the wells while on the upper there are the pegs. Why this is relevant is because when it comes to adding the glue, you could pull them up into these little sections over here and it just makes for a cleaner installation as opposed to trying it on the reverse end. Obviously, it will still work either way, but my personal preference is to add it on this end first. Also, this end has all the stern planes and stuff in place and if you try to flip it over you know they tend to fall out in addition to adding the glue to these sections i'm of course going to be adding a thin little bead around the entire length of the lower hull so from the sections over here all the way up to the bow nose everything is going to be getting a nice little seam of super glue You do want to add a small little drop right here at the hinge point just so that the hinge stays solid and doesn't want to flex on you when the when the stern plane is in operation. Also, you notice I didn't really add any glue to these sections over here because again, once everything clamps into place, although this area is not glued, the remainder of the glued area will hold and support everything further. So, let's continue with the gluing. It also pays to use the uh, slow drying stuff for this because obviously this is a very long section of plastic and if the glue is setting while you're still applying it, that's obviously an issue. All right, the glue has been applied. Let me grab the upper and clasp the two pieces together. When you're installing it, it might give you a little bit of resistance, but that's only because the pegs need to find their sweet spot. Once they line up, the thing will just pop into place to further aid with the alignment, you, it's a good idea to use rubber bands to secure everything in place just so the glues have a nice way to set. If the thing shifts on you, it's going to cause some problems. Use as many rubber bands as you deem fit to get the fit to where you want it to be. To keep the rear plane area nice and secure, just a simple clamp like this one here is all that's required. Let me continue with the rubber bands on the middle section here of the hull, and then I could go ahead and move on to the next section of this build. And just like with Blue Oyster called having cowbells, you cannot have enough rubber bands when you're building one of these skipjack models. 
On this one here, the rubber bands you'll notice are really more or less focused in this area here of the middle section of the hull. And that's because for whatever reason, with the way this one turned out, there was a seam in this area over here that was a bit larger compared to some of the areas on the hull sections. What's interesting is that I didn't really encounter this on the skipjack that I built a little while ago. Must be with just the way, again, this one turned out with the way the upper and lower hull have sections were connected together. But it's no big deal. Once the glues are fully set, I could go ahead and start polishing everything away with the bodywork. A few passes with some red putty and some sandpaper, and the thing is going to be completely seamless. After the CA is thoroughly dry, it's now time to go ahead and remove the rubber bands. Which is a somewhat easy and pretty straightforward process. Of course, you are going to have locations where the rubber bands adhere to the side of the hull. If it does, just don't worry about that. The rubber bands are a sacrificial piece, of course. And if they do, like this one over here, leave some sections of rubber behind, fear not, these are easily polished away with a little bit of sandpaper. With all of the rubber bands removed, you get to see what the hull sections look like now that they're fully together. Of course, there is going to be a unsightly seam running across these areas. On some areas, the seam's a little bit tighter packed compared to like this spot over here, but that is normal from what I've seen on these builds, and this is something that is easily taken care of with the bodywork that I'm going to be touching on in a moment. But long story short, it's going to be basically the same procedure as I touched upon before with the midriff sections. Before I could go ahead and add the red putty, I first want to hit these sections with some sandpaper. The sandpaper is really important because it does two things. First, it eliminates the large chunks of super glue that are found on the surface, and it also removes these shards of rubber band that I touched upon before. If you omit this step and just go right to the red putty, this is going to be problematic because even if you don't have the rubber band shards like I do over here, you still have these large areas of rough super glue and these still need to be sanded down regardless if there's putty on top or not by removing these problems before the red putty gets added this is a way to streamline and make the build go by much easier As I touched upon before, a palm sander will make the job go by a bit easier, but if you're using a palm sander, you have to pay attention when you're sanding. You want to make sure that when you're sanding the surface, you don't focus primarily on one area because this will actually ha have the effect of adding a flat to the section, which will actually harm the look of the model as opposed to helping it. So when you're using it, you want to make sure you're going with the curvature of the hull. The other thing you want to watch out for is on areas here on the front where we have these torpedo tubes. Obviously these are engraved panel lines, but they're not engraved too deep. So if you're using a palm sander or any type of mechanical sanding device, it may run the risk of over sanding the section over here. So you want to be very careful with that. Having said that, however, you can see how much quicker the job is done via the palm sander. And again, I'm using the same 150 grit sandpaper as I touched upon before. One place where the palm sander comes in really handy are on these flat sections over here on the sides of the two stern planes. Because they're flat, you just put it against the side over here and it'll make really short work of it. <laughs> Like so. For the areas underneath the dive planes, however, this is something that you're going to have to do by hand with just a little bit of sandpaper because obviously you're not going to be able to get this machine to go into these confines. Another technique that you can use in certain tightened spots is by using a razor blade like this one over here. You can gently scrape up and down the surfaces, which will move a little bit of material that will also have the same effect of the sanding that I mentioned before. Although it's beneficial to use this in really tight in areas like this area over here underneath the dive plane as opposed to trying to do the entire side hull with that same procedure. Having said that however it still can be done it's just not optimum. After the hull is pre-prepped it's now time to smear on the putty. As last time using the same 
red glazing spot putty that I touched upon earlier, and it's going to be applied and sanded in basically the exact same manner. Like I may have mentioned before, when it comes to these skipjack builds, about 70% of the build is just doing body work. Outside of that, it's just, you know, following the kit instructions and gluing halves together. But the body work is probably one of the most important aspects on this model. It's also at this time I want to mention, it's probably a good thing that the hull isn't as detailed as it really can or should be. On the real submarine, of course, these things are all welded together and you are going to have weld lines. Granted, the weld lines are polished and, you know, Electric Boat or Mare Island, whoever does their job with taking care of that, but regardless, the, the thing is, you know, it's made from real pieces of steel, of course. On the model here, there are absolutely no weld lines or any other surface details on the sides whatsoever, outside of some, you know, axis panels and things along those lines. Normally, this is something that would be arguably a weak point of the kit, and honestly it is, but it comes in handy when doing the assembly because obviously with the amount of bodywork that these models get, you know, it's a four half assembly, of course. If you have panel lines that are molded in, it's actually going to be a detriment because it's going to be making the sanding go by in a much harder manner as opposed to something that's completely smooth like this where, you know, you can polish it down all day long and not worry about really harming anything. So with that <laughs> uh, long-winded, uh, you know, sidetrack out of the way, I could apply the putty. Putty, like I said before, is just going to be smeared on in some locations. Some areas, like this area here, it's a bit of a substantial gap. So this may take two, maybe three coats just to fill it in. Because when you add the putty, you can't just add a lot of it because it'll cave in on you. And also, because this is too lean based, it will weaken the plastic if you apply a large volume of it. I may apply the trick where you fill in this gap here with a little piece of styrene. That is another trick that you can do. In fact, I might do that or I might just roll with just the putty as is. Uh, the putty, again, it's going to be applied all throughout the main side sections, but I'm also going to be applying it right here towards the top. You see, one quirk that this kit does have is that they have this integral line molded into this section over here. This line is not found on the real submarine at all. This line is actually a cue for the water line, which is interesting because if you look on the side of the box, it, they render it with the low water line rendition. However, of course, these things have water lines that are up to here and you know some examples of some of the boats out there have the red oxide going all the way up to this section. More than likely this is a carryover from the blueprints. This model here just screams I followed the plans to the T and that's what you see here which again is for better or for worse. I could touch upon that you know in more depth either in this video or in another video but Regardless, this line here, in my opinion, hurts the look of the model, and I'm going to be removing it as I did on the other Skipjack build. To do that, it's done with, you guess it, more red putty. So I'm going to be smearing a ton right here on the side of the hull, and also another smear going across this section over here. When you're applying it on the top portion, you have to be careful on the front array, where obviously you don't want, you want to, you know, delete this line here, but you want to keep the cut line found in this section over here, and that requires some some very careful placement of the red putty. So, okay, I guess I talked long enough. Let me go ahead and take care of the smearing. So after the putty was applied, the model was set outside to allow 
the putty to fully set and dry outdoors. The nice sunny day we had was perfect to allow the putty to dry in a faster manner. And also keeping the thing outside is great because this red putty here is quite pungent and will stink up the shop, specifically when you use a lot of volume, which clearly this model has. At this point, you'll notice that it looks really, really ugly. But rest assured, this is normal when you're building a model like this and doing the type of bodywork required to get this thing built. Before I start sanding, I do want to point out that when you're applying the putty on the front section, you want to be careful because of, like I mentioned before with the sonar dome, you don't want to plug up the little panel lines that are integrally molded on. If you do get a little bit of putty in there, it's not a problem. You could easily just carve it out with a needle file or an X-Acto or something. On some other areas, I am going to be adding a second coat in patches because like right here, you'll see where when the putty is drying, it kind of has this like spreading or cracking type look to it. This is because of the tooling that the stuff is made of. Polystyrene begins to dissolve and this stuff, when it sets it, tends to do stuff like that, specifically when you add a bit of it in volume. But it's not a problem, it polishes away really easily. Just a quick little smear and that should be enough to seal the job further. On some other areas you'll notice that the line is still present when I applied the putty. This is something that can also happen quite frequently when you're doing large areas like this, but again another swipe should be suffice for plugging up further. Once the new layer of putty is added, Rinse, wash, repeat. This goes ahead, enters back into dry time. Once the thing is fully set, I could progress with the sanding procedure. So here's the model with the second coat of putty now all set. At this point here, it's ready for the sanding. Like I may have stated before, a palm sander can probably do the job, but me personally, I like to do it by hand just because I like to have more control over the location that's being sanded as opposed with using a mechanical device where it may require more coats of putty because you may over sand something or like I said before worst case scenario you actually over sand the thing unevenly and now you have a section of the hull that's concave or flattened and that's something you really really don't want to do but you have to be really asleep behind the wheel for you to even <laughs> do that realistically but having said that I'm still going to roll with the hand sanding technique the Technique is identical to what I showed before, so I'm not really going to get that on camera. There's really no point. So let's cut across to when the wet sanding has been completed and the surface is completed and is ready for the next step. <clears throat> okay, so that should have done the job. The sanding procedure went by without any problems, but it is a tedious task, to say the least. Basically, this is the bulk of the kit's work right here, and I just want to take this opportunity to say, if you're the type of person that doesn't like to do any sort of putty or body work, or you don't really have a whole lot of experience with putty work, this is most certainly not going to be the kit for you. As you can quite clearly tell, basically three quarters of this project is None other than deleting seams and taking care of the bodywork. Outside of that, you know, the remainder of the kit parts are quite simple. But this is basically the work of the project. So having said that quick little disclaimer, once the pieces are all sanded down, you can see how smooth everything looks. The next thing to do on the hull is to actually carve out some of the areas that were sanded down and partially puttied over like on the on the bow over here near the torpedo tubes, you can see there's a little bit of putty plugging up some of the lower sections. And also some of them just weren't really that pronounced originally with the way the things are molded. So this is something I'm going to have to engrave a little bit by hand just to make the pieces a little bit more deeper. And I believe, yeah, like around here on, again, <laughs> right over here on this portion of the sonar, on the top mounted sonar, there's a little section of putty that also needs to be carved away too. And then after that, we can progress with the remainder of the build. One other thing I wanted to mention is that on a few of the areas, even after the putty work was all sanded down flush, there were a few little cracks and small little craters where the piece needs to have been completely smooth. And in order to finish those off, rather than redoing the putty technique, I just simply filled them in with some thick super glue. 
the thick super glue is a good idea to use on that application because the cracks and the pits are so tiny that it doesn't really warrant the need to hit it with another layer of putty and the super glue will do an adequate job at plugging it up. Once the super glue sets, you then just polish it down with the sandpaper like I showed before. And here's what it looks like with those panel lines cleaned out. To do the cleanup work, I actually recycle one of my old double action needles that I have here. If you do a lot of airbrushing like I do, you actually wear these things out every so often. And rather than throwing them away, I actually keep them in a bin because they actually make really good scribes for, you know, procedures like this. They don't really come up all that often, but, you know, when they do, these things can actually be pretty handy. Basically what I do is I just go ahead and I carefully go and just carve out the areas that were clogged up with the putty or and or with the super glue. This was done to the sonar section here on the front, but also to several of the torpedo tubes that we have here on the nose. On one or two occasions, I accidentally slipped off and I actually put a gouge into a section that it really shouldn't have. So if this happens, don't panic. It's something that can easily be fixed. The only thing you do is take a drop of super glue, add it in that section, wait for it to dry, and then just polish it down with the sandpaper as you do with the remainder of the bodywork. After a few passes with the sandpaper, either dry or wet, the, the gouge is completely filled in and it's no longer gonna be a problem. So with the bodywork done now at this point, I could finally progress with the remainder of the detailing on the hull area. It's now time to turn to the sail, specifically with the sail bodies. The components you see here are straight out of the packaging with the exception of removing some bits of flash off camera. Other than that, what you see is basically what you get. However, before I can go ahead and actually do any assembly on these sections here, the first thing that I am going to do is to pre-paint the interior sections of the two sail halves. This is because of the window section found on the front here, the beacon area, as well as the interior section of the induction cover. This is best done at this point because obviously once everything's assembled, you're not gonna be able to get in there to apply the paint. The paint is going to be standard flat black spray paint, and this is again something I'm going to be touching upon towards the latter half of the video. With the bodywork basically being complete on the hull, it's time to switch gears and get the sail halves assembled. As I touched upon before, the insides were spray painted black for the reasons that I already touched upon, and also you'll see that the rear beacon light here has been mounted in place. One note on the beacon, this is a very, very, very important part. And honestly, if it's probably one of the most important pieces on the boat because if you lose this, you are screwed. So you have to take some really good care when deburring it. Also, more importantly, when you paint the rear section over here because if this thing flings off the Lost Partia, yeah, you're, you're gonna be in for a world of hurt. So once the glue is set, I tack the piece inside with uh, two little drops of super glue. Normally I don't like to use super glue on clear plastic components because CA when it says has a tendency to fog up and obviously for clear plastic, it's something that's really less than ideal. However, I use two really, really small volumes of it in these two locations. So it's set out in the open. Obviously if it's together, you'll have more of a gas issue. And once the piece set, you'll notice that there are no gas problems whatsoever. If you're doing this, you might want to try a different type of adhesive, like model airplane canopy adhesives would be a good choice, or white glue, and even, dare I say, old school testers red tube. Only for this application, none for anything else on the entire model, just for this one right here. But I got lucky with the super glue, so I'm just gonna roll with that. With this piece fully set in place, it's now time to assemble the two sail halves together. This is really easily done. You just simply just plug the two together and then rubber band accordingly just to keep it in one piece while the glue is set. The top portion of the sail is facilitated with this little piece over here and this simply just plugs into place. And of course, you named it when you're done with the gluing, you're gonna have to go and do some body work. And on this one here, the body work is gonna be done primarily on the top ridge over here where the top section clips on, the front section, which is super important, and equally as important right here along the induction cover. The two halves where they meet right here on the rear section of the sail, this tends to 
set pretty well so there's going to be a really tiny little seam over here nothing that's going to be really major but you know a couple passes with some sandpaper should be suffice on the last skipjack that i've done i don't recall the need of any soup or uh, any red putty on these locations here in order to do the body work just some thick ca and some sanding was all that was required so uh, the only thing, oh, the one last thing I want to mention is, just like before, when it comes to the volume of glue that you're going to be put on the rear section over here, you want to control it a little bit. Don't use nearly as much as you do on the remainder of the of the sail, because again, when it sets, you don't want any gas to cause any problems. Also, one other thing to point out is that now that the rear section is painted, if you look at the tower from the outside, you'll see that the piece has a nice yellow glow to it, which is exactly what you're looking for with this component. Of course, when you're gluing the sail halves together, you want to use a bunch of rubber bands just to make sure that the piece is as tightly squeezed as possible so that when the glue set, the seam work is minimalized. This set here is all ready to go. So I can go ahead and take off the rubber bands. And then from here, it's you guessed it, the usual suspects. Time to do some body work. With the body work completed on the sail, the next thing to do is to enhance it with the detailing. As I mentioned before with the hull, the skipjack kit is very, very simplistic in terms of surface detailing because the designers more or less copied the plans that are out there. And although most people would say, hey, that's perfect, you know, the plans are what they used to build the real one, ergo they should be perfect for the model. The problem is if you follow the plans, you're not going to have the details. And this may sound strange, specifically to people who don't build ships, but on ship models specifically, a lot of model builders out there, they use the plans as gospel, and because that, this is the type of detailing that you will get. What I mean by that is totally smooth sides, no well beads, no fasteners, no rivets, none of that stuff, just a nice smooth surface. And by and large, most of the ship builders out there seem to like that. This is something that I've personally had arguments with people over because if you ever get an opportunity to see a real vessel in person, you'll know that the thing is absolutely anything but. They are covered in welds, they are covered in fasteners, and in many cases, depending on, you know, when the vessel was refitted and with submarines and ships, it's like every six months or so when they get back to port, it goes into a shipyard where they refit the thing. A lot of times they'll make changes or repairs to the thing that deviate from the plans. For instance, it gets back, there's a piece of metal that's rusted out. They just simply cut that piece out, weld a new patch in place, and, you know, off it goes. Those are not going to be something that you will find in the plan books. As an example of this, here we have floating in the shop a plan for a U.S. Portsmouth step sail for a American fleet boat that was upgraded in the 1950s and 60s. You can see the quality of the plans look very similar to the quality details found here on the skipjack. Like, for instance, you know, the holes, or I should say the panels for the axis. If you look over here, you'll see the same type of detailing that is present. However, if we compare this to what the tower is supposed to look like with the details, here you will see the rivets and a bunch of other stuff that is just not found on the plans. However, if you compare and contrast that with the actual vessel, in this case the USS Torsk, you will quickly see exactly which one looks more realistic. Yes, the plans give you a good idea on the the correct shape and geometry. However, when it comes to surface detailing, the plans are always lacking. Specifically, this is the case with ships. Not so much with tanks, but ships and submarines, this is more common than not. So back to the model over here. In order to enhance it further, I'm going to add the details that are absent on these sections. And here you can see a photograph of the real tower on one of the skipjack class submarines and you can clearly see that these panels here are covered in fasteners which mount them to the side of the sail. Back to the model over here, on this side this is what the unit looks like stock. Not bad, not too shabby, however if we compare that to what I did to the opposite side, you will see exactly how much more improved the model looks and this will be really appreciated after the thing is fully painted and weathered. These details here were all added via a pin vise with a really small Dremel bit. 
the bit size should come out on camera once it focuses in. And these bits, like in all these videos I mentioned, was purchased from the supplier listed below. This procedure, you want to use a pin vise and you want to avoid a Dremel at all costs because you just need to make small indentations into the plastic. You're not going all the way through to make something like a limber hole. So you're only going to be going to the surface, I don't know, like, I don't even know the amount, but it's less than, it's about, yeah, about half a millimeter or so. And the Dremel is, tends to be overpowerful, and you might just punch all the way through, which is not exactly helping your case. The other thing is the Dremel is more unwieldy because of the size and shape of it. You have this mass over here, and you're just trying to do some precision drilling, and this can cause some other problems. And the other problem with the Dremel is that on many of the Dremels that I personally have worked on, or worked with, the bit tends to not be as true as it is when it's spinning really fast, and because of that, the hole's gonna be larger than it really needs to be. So, in order to avoid all of those problems, the pin vise is the way to go. You just simply just, you know, sit there and you, you know, have at it on the surface, and then after a little bit of time, you'll have all of the patterns laid out. Another thing I want to point out at this time are with the limber holes found right here on the rear portion of the Fairwater. These limber holes are present on the real unit and are also present on the Mobius tooling, but they're just indentations. In order to improve them further, all you got to do is with a Dremel with another larger Dremel bit, which the size will be posted right there on the bottom of the screen, you just go in and you drill out the indentations. The indentations are nice and clearly marked on the on the tooling itself, so having the bit line up where it needs to go is not a problem at all. And again, the pin vise here makes short work of this job as well. While on that note, I also went ahead and drilled out the four holes found on the top portion here on the top of the sail. On the real unit, I believe there would be a scaffolding that would be position in this place over here and this is something that is generally seen when the submarine I've seen is cruising on the surface they usually have some kind of a platform there now that's also true on more modern class subs not sure if the skipjack did that as well but it is kind of curious to see four mounting holes in these four locations right here on the bridge so just my educated guess I believe that's what these are for too so from here I'm just going to add the remainder of the details that I mentioned before on the opposite side. No real point to get that on camera, it's just me sitting over here working with a pin vise in order to get the holes. So let's cut across to where that's completed and I'm going to be adding something to this little section over here. So after the last little partial hole is drilled into the surface, I like to go over the surface with some sandpaper just to blend in any of the plastic that is pulled up from the hand drilling process. Once the surface is sanded down, you're all set and you're ready to move on. Oh, of course, you want to keep away from the beacon over here with the sanding because if you scuff it up, it's going to kind of make the piece less transparent, which is something you don't want to do. So this leads us to the siren, which is right here on the front of the sail. The kit just has an indentation in this area with no other detailing that is supplied. And that is where the ECA set comes in. On the set here, you will see a cylindrical shaped object. This is the detailing for the siren. It is made to be a drop in installation, so all you gotta do is add a little drop of glue on this section here and insert the siren into place. Once fitted, you're all good to go. The next thing I wanna touch upon is, while also on this runner, involves this little square found on this side and this side of the sail. You'll notice on the kit, it's just a simple little square like this that's found on the surface. And you'll also note that I did not add any sort of fasteners to this detailing. And if I would have added those fasteners there, it would be wrong. The reason is because this little square here is not an axis hatch like it is on the remaining ones on the sail. Instead, this here are for the beacons which are found on the side. All boats have a red and a green lantern found on either side of the vessel for port and starboard and the submarine here is absolutely no different but the submarine needs to be nice and sleek so things like beacons kind of add drag so what they did was on the skipjacks they incorporate a system where the beacons are retracting so when the submarine is 
underway underwater. They fold up and make for a nice smooth surface here on the side of the sail. But if you're on the surface or at port and you need to have the beacons light, hit a little switch, they swivel out like a 1980s car and you have the beacons ready to go. The beacon detailing is also found on the set here like I may or may not have mentioned before. The beacons are a drop-in installation and again are printed in the same HD material as are the remainder of the parts. Because the pieces are HD they are translucent so they are going to be mounted at the tail end of the build because I'm going to be carefully painting around the areas here so that I have some nice translucent material exposed which will give you an effect similar to the clear plastic piece that I mentioned before on the rear beacon. Hopefully it comes out on camera, but here the beacon is fitted in place. When you're installing it, you don't want to have it flush against the front section over here. It needs to be somewhat recessed into the little hole found on the front. On the front portion, I'm not done yet because I'm going to add a small little piece of wire because I've seen on several examples of the real skipjack, there is a little bracket that connects these two sections together. I guess it acts as some sort of a guard, but this is something that's gonna be fabricated out of a small little piece of wire that's gonna be flattened and then glued to the location that we have here. Also, at this time, I am not going to be mounting on either the array, the windows, or the tower planes. All of those aforementioned details are going to be mounted at the end of the build after everything is fully painted and weathered. The clear glass windows should be pretty obvious why. And as for the other locations, that's because it's easier to paint them off the model and install them after everything is completed, as opposed to trying to work around them. If you are making the tower with a different type of paint job, either the whole sub's going to be black, well then the, the tower planes can possibly be added, but keep in mind, you are because the planes are workable, you are going to have a little area behind here that may be missed with the paint, so rule of thumb is it's easier to install them after everything is fully painted and weathered, as opposed to building the whole sub and then just, you know, going in dry, so to speak, with the paintwork. Of course, just like with basically everything on this model, the propeller is going to need some bodywork as well. With the way the piece is designed, it is a two-piece assembly, and then once it's installed, you will have these weird little grooves that are found in between the fan blades. And in order to polish these down, this is done really easily with a round needle file. And what's great about the round needle file is that you can really get into these tight confines right over here where the blade makes contact with the cone and if you just move in this type of a motion after a while the seam work is completely polished away one thing i just realized i negated to mention is that for filling in the gap work this is done with thick super glue and not red putty you don't want to use putty for this type of procedure it's too clunky and it'll require more of a cleanup the super glue is just applied with your finger in this type of a format, and then once it's set, you can just polish it down with the needle file like I just mentioned. With the sails detailing out of the way, it's time to circle back to the hull to finish off the last of details to get this thing ready for painting. Which brings us to the hatches. Both the bow and the stern hatch, as I may have touched upon before, have details that are integrally molded into the tooling, which are mounting locations for the four little securing points that are found around the hatch. On the real submarine, these are for a diving bell to strap to the submarine in order for the crew to exit the boat underwater in case there's an emergency. Well, like I stated before, the holes are integrally molded in and all the builder needs to do to improve the model is to drill these out with a pin vise with a small bit and then add, or I should say fabricate a new hook here out of some thin pieces of floor wire. Once the pieces are bent to shape, they simply just slide into their appropriate location and once mounted will improve the detailing. The combination of the little hooks along with the replacement hatch really does enhance this model compared to the out of the box configuration. While on this portion of the hull, I also want to point out the other addition that I made was a small little eyelet to the center portion here of the marker buoy. There is another unit mounted on the front and the exact same detailing was mounted as well. The center portion of the buoy has a eyelet ring that is present or at least was present from the reference photographs that I saw of the real boats, and this was fabricated out of that same bit of thin floor wire that I mentioned before, but I went ahead and bent it to the shape of a small little eyelet, and then mounted to the location via a small hole that I drilled again with the pen vise. 
While on the topic of the pin vise, you can see that on the axis panels over here, just like with the ones on the tower, I went ahead and fabricated the detailing for the very small countersunk fasteners, which will be present on these pieces as well. And that's all there really is to it for the build. At this point here, this model is ready for painting, where the next sunny day I get, I'll be able to get this thing outside, hang it up like a big dead fish, and get the model into paint. But one other thing I want to mention before I do that is the tower, or I should say the sail at this time, is not glued on. As I touched upon before, this is going to be painted separately off of the model because it does make things easier. However, if you are going to build the model with the tower in place because of one reason or another, I strongly recommend hitting this area of the model with a can of flat black spray paint, specifically if you're going to be painting the thing all black. The reason is because obviously getting into this area over here is going to be basically impossible once this piece is fitted in place. So you want to go ahead and make sure that this is painted so that when you secure the tower on, you're going to have absolutely no chances of there being bare exposed plastic remaining. The one last thing I want to mention before we cut away to this thing getting painted is with the sail. First, you can see what it looks like with the siren and that guard mounted in place. The siren will definitely be more appreciated after the thing is painted, but you know, you can still see it here regardless. The next thing I want to mention involves the beacon. Of course, this you don't want to get any paint on, so I'm going to take some thin masking tape, cut it to shape, and just put it over this location over here to protect the beacon. Fortunately, it's a real simple shape. It's not anything that's really heavily curved, like a canopy or anything like that. So a thin little sliver of painting tape should be suffice with protecting this piece. As I just alluded to before, the model is now going to head off into paint. And this is something I've actually had quite a few questions about from the last Skipjack build that I've done. So, you know, here we go. I'm going to go over the steps on actually how to go through all the procedures. First and foremost, this thing needs to be painted outdoors. With a model this size, you don't want to do this in the shop because something with this volume of paint is obviously going to pollute the place, specifically if you don't have some sort of a paint booth, which I don't in my actual shop. So this is the type of thing you're going to want to do outdoors, and fortunately today is a gorgeous ideal day to do something like this because it's sunny, it's warm, it's early spring, and it's gorgeous to just be outdoors. Aside from the overall size, the model shape is also something that adds to the complexity, so to speak, on how to paint it. This is something that's best painted in the configuration that we have here, where you have it suspended, like I alluded to before, as a big dead fish. Having the model in this type of configuration makes it much easier to thoroughly get coats of paint on all the surface evenly, as opposed to, you know, painting half of it with the model one way and then flipping it when the paint dries and, you know, continue with the paint job. With this way, this does simplify the build quite a lot. For hanging it, this here is actually an old coat rack that was found in a Kmart, and as anyone in the United States will know, Kmart went under a number of years ago, and they were basically liquidating all of their inventory for pennies on the dollar, and I was able to pick this thing up here for like five or ten bucks. So if you have the opportunity to pick up one of these type of coat racks, I recommend it specifically for cheap because they are fantastic painting racks, and this thing has painted a lot of models. To hang the model up, you'll notice that I went ahead and took some wire, and I put it through the section here where the rudder is going to be plugged into after the model is painted and goes into completion. By doing it with this way, this is a fantastic way to support the model's weight because this section here is obviously not going to break or pop off during painting. And you'll notice that it makes no contact whatsoever with the hull itself. So this is going to be really clean during the painting work and you're not going to have any sort of overspray to contend with in those areas. The next question that I get is exactly what brands of paints to use and how to apply them. Do I use Tamiya? Do I use Model Master? Vallejo? Do I use an airbrush, paintbrush, paint roller? You know, how exactly are you supposed to get paint onto this thing? And the answer is extremely simple. One great thing about submarines in general is that they are ridiculously affordable and easy to paint. The paints that I use on my builds and the one that you're going to see being applied to this build here is none other than... El Cheapo Rattle Can Flat Black Spray Paint. This is what's going to be used to paint the entire model. 
And for the color again, I'm using flat black. There is this notion out there that you should use gloss to paint the submarines. Well, that's not really the best way to go about it. You see, although technically when the submarine is launched or when it's freshly painted, it's painted in gloss black. However, the gloss immediately dulls out with not a whole lot of time of being exposed to both salt water and constant sunlight. So if you're gonna be painting it with gloss black, you better be making it at the time of launch, okay? You know, when they smash the bottle on the bow, it goes into the water, they play anchors away. That's when you would wanna roll with the model being painted in gloss black. However, if you're modeling the submarine in any sort of condition after that, the gloss is not the way to go, and if anything, it actually hurts the look of the build because it looks massively anachronistic. Because when you're weathering it, it's just not going to look good. So, rule of thumb when you're painting any sort of submarine, flat black's the way to go. One other thing I want to mention in terms of flat black, you want to get the cheapest can that you possibly can. You may want to get some of the more expensive stuff like Rust Oleum or Krylon. And first, I want to say Rust Oleum, I've stay away from because I've had bad experiences in the past where the stuff just doesn't dry for some reason. I don't know, Rust-Oleum needs to, you know, do some soul searching and get their, their formula ironed out because I've had more than one occasion where I paint the model and the stuff stays sticky. It just doesn't dry. And that's definitely not something you want to do on a plastic model like this. Also, uh, some of the more premium brand paints like Krylon, they seem to work better. However, because of the plastic nature of this model here, I would hazard against it because it can possibly harm the fit, harm the actual material that the thing is molded in. Again, neither of which is ideal. I always found best just the cheap Home Depot can of spray paint, which I have here, is what works best on all these plastic models. And that's the one I used on the Skipjack, and I'm going to be using it again on the Scamp. It applies smooth, it applies evenly, and on top of that, it dries really quick. It's basically everything you want in a can of spray paint. Another option out there is the brand from Walmart and also Lowe's. I have here a Lowe's branded one. This one here, it's okay at best. I picked up a case of them back in the fall because uh, that's the only thing that was available at the time. And I've used them on any number of models that have already been posted on the channel and a few more that are in the pipeline. However, I will say that the Home Depot stuff is a better product. It just goes on smoother and also this stuff here tends to be a little bit more runnier, which is okay, but this means with this one here, you're gonna need to apply more coats because of the thin nature. The Home Depot stuff, within two coats or so, you should be all set. So that's one thing to compare and contrast. The Walmart brand is similar. However, I'll notice that I believe Lowe's and Home and uh, Walmart I use probably the same vendor because I have seen cans with the Walmart brand with this design of spray can over here and they tend to be very similar to what you get from the Lowe's brand so that's just my speculation but if the can looks like this I've seemed to notice that they do work out better. The model at this point is now going to head off into paint where I'm going to be painting the entire thing evenly with flat black. This is also something that some people are probably going to question because once the flat black dries, I'm then going to mask up the waterline and paint the remainder of the hull with the primer red. Some people are wondering, well, John, since there's actually more primer red on this thing than flat black, shouldn't you paint it with the primer first? And although technically you can, that's definitely an option. However, I always found it better to paint the whole thing in flat black first because the flat black acts as a better primer. I know this is going to sound funny compared to actual primer red. However, the flat black does two things. First, it coats the plastic and it gives it a nice solid base to work on for the other paint adhere to. Also, the black, since you now you have two coats of paint on this thing, the red is just a superficial layer. And then because of the nature of these things, when you handle them, you move them around, even if you move them from stand to sand, occasionally, you know, it, you, it's not unforeseeable to get a scratch or two on those lower hull extremities. Well, if you have the coat of flat black underneath, if the red scratches off, you have black exposed as opposed to bare plastic, which will actually help the model because it looks more like weathering as opposed to having great plastic popping out. So that's why I like to go with the whole thing painted from, from tip to front being flat black. So enough talking, let's go ahead and do that and cut across to when I'm ready to put on the red. After not a whole lot of time, the model is fully spray painted with the base coat of flat black. This is true for not just the hull, but the sail, the fins, and all the other various accessories that need to be painted at this time. 
in order to fully paint everything, I went through about two and a half cans of spray paint. So, you know, if you cover your bases, you could easily pull off the paintwork with four cans on hand. Once the paint is fully dry and set, I could go ahead and mask up the waterline so I could start putting on the red primer. Of course, this needs to be done after the base flat black is 100% dry. Not just dry to the touch, but dry through and through. This is going to be extremely important because if you go ahead and put paint on a layer of paint that's drying like this one here, you're just gonna open up to a bunch of problems, some of which would include paint cracking, as well as also with the tape itself ripping off of the model when it comes time for the reveal. Neither of which is something that you wanna have happen to your build. So the best way to avoid this is you let this thing sit and dry for hours on end. Once the thing is bone dry, then and only then can you progress with the remainder of the paintwork. Once the black is fully dry, it's then time to mask it up for the red waterline. And this is a portion where the build really opens up with just how many different options are available to the builder. There is this misconception out there, specifically amongst people who are just not that well inundated on these boats, where, oh, nuclear submarines are completely boring. You know, not like World War II boats where there's a bunch of different camouflage patterns and stuff. Nuclear subs, they're just black and red. Well... No, there's actually several different options available for just the waterline alone, let alone the measure that's going to be going on the remainder of the, of the superstructure. The waterline can be rendered in two options on this class of boat, because I've seen examples of both of them. First is the low red line, which is seen on the example on the box art, and it's also seen on my USS Skipjack build that I did a little while ago. For this particular option, I'm going to be rendering this model with the red line that it goes all the way up to the water line, which you can see right here with the position that the tape is laid out. To mask up the water line, I'm utilizing blue painter's tape, and this is something that I want to stress for anyone that's building a ship or submarine model out there. This is the one aspect where the quality of the end result will definitely be reflective on the quality of the masking tape that you use. If you use the El Cheapo white stuff, you can still pull it off. In fact, I've, I'm looking at a cabin full of boats that that was actually done on. However, I will say that it is noticeably better and easier if you go with the blue painter's tape in comparison to the white stuff. The tape is just laid out to the approximate location where the water line was. Now, remember, this kit does have a line molded into the superstructure that tells you where the water line is. And, just like I did on my skipjack, the molded water line was promptly deleted because, again, it's something that I don't have any interest in seeing when the model's fully painted and weathered. So, the, the water line was deleted with the bodywork. However, this was the exact location where I am putting the tape. To put the tape in, I had to look really, really carefully to try to find where the original waterline was. And I actually had to guesstimate because the bodywork came out so well that the line was, you know, pretty much invisible. So with a few tricks, I was able to find out where it was, and that's where I laid out the tape. The two areas to watch out for is with the front and the rear. Obviously, the side sections are relatively easy to put on. It's just, you know, straightaways with a small little curve towards the front and towards the rear. But it's the front and the stern, or I should say the bow and the stern, where you have to do some creative measures in order to shape the tape to where you want it. With the stern here towards the camera, you have to see what the rear section looks like. With the curvature that's found in this area here, you can't just take the tape and bend it around in one fell swoop. Because of the angle here, the tape is going to crinkle up and it's just not going to work too well on you. For something like this, it's best to use actually that thin, really cool painting masking tape that you see for use on car type paint jobs. You also see them a lot on like those like motorcycle shows that were on you know Discovery Channel back in the day. Anyway. I don't have any of that stuff in the shop at the moment, so instead I went with a different technique where I actually just lay the tape on the model and then I draw out the curvature with a pencil. I peel off the tape, cut the, sh the piece to shape, and then just stick it on in the format that you see here. One other thing I want to mention is that a lot of people tend to overstress getting the waterline to be as symmetrical as possible, and this, you know, may be a thing that 
a person might, you know, have a desire to do, it's not necessarily accurate. If you look at the real ones, this line here is basically all over the place. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and throw a picture up of the real USS Sculpin, where you can see this portion here right before launch, and yeah, the lines don't exactly match up. So, you know, you have some room for a little bit of deviation, and if anything, it actually makes the build look more realistic. On the bow of the boat, you get to see what it looks like just before I peel the tape off and cut it out. Here I took the tape, laid it across the bow, drew the curvature with a pencil, and we all guess, or I should say we all know what's going to happen from this point here. I'm going to peel it off, cut it out with the tape, and restick it on. Once that's completed, the next thing to do is to thoroughly mask up the top extremities here because you will get overspray on these areas if you don't. Even if you have the tiniest, smallest little sliver in the masking, you will always get overspraying. It's law. It just happens every single time. And it's also why you can see why I recommend not installing the sail until everything is painted and weathered. The sail just gets dropped right on and you're all set. If you have the sail on in this configuration, you can still do it, but obviously it's going to require a hell of a lot more paperwork and mask work in order to protect it, preventing it from getting hit with any sort of overspray. And after the masking is complete, this is what the model looks like. From here, I could go ahead, suspend it back up on the rack, and get the red hull painted. For the red, this is another common question that I get, is what color to use for the red? A lot of people out there, they'll just take, you know, flat red of one flavor or another, either Tamiya or, you know, some other brand that's similar. Or they'll go ahead and just use just, you know, flat red spray paint or gloss red, you know, depending on who you ask. However, for this build here, and just like with my other build, and this is also true for all the other ship builds that are in the shop that, you know, don't really get seen on camera, the color that we go with is just red oxide primer. The color is used because, well, frankly, this is the color that's used on the real ships. They, the red hulls are painted via red oxide primer because of, you know, all the reasons and benefits that red oxide offers. The paint choice is just, you know, Ace Brand spray paint. So again, painting these models, like I stressed before, is very, very affordable compared to some other, you know, model options out there. The model is going to be suspended the same way I add the black paint, and then the red paint is going to be applied in that format. For the volumes of paint, one can should be more than enough to do the job. However, I always like to hedge my bet, so I have two cans on hand in case the need be arises. But I'm pretty confident I'll be able to pull this off with a single can. And here's the submarine with the majority of the paint work out of the way. Obviously, the tape has been peeled off, so you get to see the waterline with the red oxide primer. The sail has its measure painted onto it, and this is a slightly different version of the measure compared to the one on the skipjack that I've mentioned a few times. And you can see that the marker buoys have been painted as well. The tower planes and the rudder are currently not glued on yet. This is going to be done after the model gets weathered. On the rudder, you can see that this one here is a dual tone, where we have the waterline lower section painted in primer as to match the remainder of the hull. And this one here, I did something a little bit different compared to the other skipjack, where with the other one, the markings were just simply applied to the hull and, you know, stayed in that format. For this one here, I did something a little bit different. You'll notice that where the markings are going to go, there's this sliver here of gray. This is something that I lifted directly from the real USS Scamp images where it was actually being launched. And this is something that I have seen repeated a few other times on several other boats. So this is another option out there for the builder if they so deem fit. The way these are applied is with mask. I go ahead and take tape and I mask up the little rectangle over here in the appropriate location. Once the tape is added and the area is shielded off, I just airbrush the gray into this section, leaving for the results that we see on both of these components. For the measure, as well as with the gray itself, I went with Tamiya Panzer Gray, or no, German Gray, that's the actual color, Tamiya German Gray, which is a really good substitute to the Schwartz Grau, which was a Model Master color, and sadly that's no longer available. When it comes to the measures, there are lots of, again, lots of options available. You have the dark gray version like this, there is a bluer gray, and then there's also just straight up primer gray, which is an equipment gray type primer, and that's seen on several other boats. 
but that's not the scope of this video. The application is done via the airbrush, and the sail obviously is unglued on at this point. The, the tail section over here is left in black, and this is done again with the airbrush, you airbrush the tower, and then I just go ahead and finish off the measure in these two locations. If you do have some overspray, which is something that actually did happen on this, you refine it, which is a technique called feathering, and when you're feathering it, you need to use the same type of paint that you painted the remainder of the model with. Yes, you can use just Timia flat black or any multitude of other flat blacks to get the same look. However, the color will not match because, believe it or not, blacks are different from one another depending on the, the company as well as the method on, on the application. If it's acrylic versus enamel, you know, so on and so forth. So if you do the model like I do where you use spray paints and you want to feather it, in order to do that you need to take the spray paint and you spray it into the little airbrush cup and then that will allow you to airbrush that exact paint onto the locations that you desire. But unlike with the spray paint, you actually have much more precision because again you're going with an airbrush as opposed to that giant spray gun or, you know, spray cam. And that's, you know, how I did it here. On the measure itself, this one, you'll notice the entire sail is painted with the gray as opposed to the skipjack where this portion here was black and I also the entire tail was black and has a little schwa in this section over here. Again, lots of different options available depending on the boat that you're doing. So, with this out of the way, the next thing I'm going to do is focus on the weathering. And once the weathering gets applied, I, the model could then slide off into completion where I mount on the last set of components, do the markings, blend everything in, add the varnish, and basically this one's ready for commissioning. One other thing I want to mention is that if you don't want to weather the model or you don't have experience with weathering models, you might want to just stop at this point here. This here would make an excellent shelf type display and the model itself is really, you know, good to go in this configuration. But obviously with my builds, I like to go to the next step and add the weathering. So that's what's going to happen with this one here. But it's always best to err on the side of caution because, you know, you can have a nice model that's clean or you can have a weather model that looks terrible. So, you know, that is something to factor in. While on the paintwork, I might as well touch upon the propeller, and here you can see the piece with its base coat added just before it slides off into weathering. The color is nothing more than Ace Brand Gold Spray Paint, and when you're painting propellers on model ships, Gold Spray Paint is a good color to use because even though technically the real propellers are not gold, obviously they're brass or some kind of a an alloy the gold spray paint does a good job with mimicking that pretty well and also there are a lot of different shades available from the different manufacturers where some paint is more of a copper tone and some are a more shiny bright version of this type of color here the ace one works pretty good it looks a lot like several of the real boat propellers that i've seen in person so this is going to be a great basis to work on to add the weathering. Also, I want to touch upon the use of an aftermarket propeller. There are some excellent aftermarket brass propellers out there. This is something that would be really appreciated, specifically if you're working on an array controlled submarine, where the brass propeller is probably going to be a better bet than the plastic one. However, I do want to mention the weathering. If you have, and this is something that I have seen on the internet, so that, you know some people are guilty of this, where you have a model of the sub and it's completely weathered and it looks fantastic however to pro the propeller on it is completely bright and shiny that is just something that would not work if you're going to weather you have to weather in context and all of the components specifically below the water line you know they're in submerged in salt water all the time yeah it's going to get you know some kind of corrosion on it and a propeller is definitely something that you will notice that on so that is something to mention so if you are going to use a brass prop that's awesome but be sure to go ahead and add the weathering to it, specifically if you're going to weather it, or I should say if, if you're going to weather the remainder of the submarine. And with that, that wraps up part one of this two-part video series on the 172nd scale USS Scamp SSN 588 Fast Attack Sub. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being, well, the second installment for this one over here, but also the other typical content that gets posted to this channel, of course being small and large scale military vehicle builds. 
Another way to keep in loop and new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other builds that have been seen on this channel previously. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. But also, don't forget to swing by Iron Bottom Sound Hobby Kits for more 1.72 scale model submarine detail fittings. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again in part two. Take care.